let's start, I think. Um, so, hello, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Zohar, and today I'm going to speak a little bit about, about, about bug bounty and how it can actually kill your application security posture. <laughs> um, just the title alone, I'm aware, is a little bit controversial and might annoy some people, uh, especially as bug bounty over the last few years became a big trend and the industry is sort of shifting its focus from traditional application security control and penetration testing and threat modeling and everything to more and more bug, bug, bug bounty. So speaking a little bit on the uh, other side of bug bounty might hit it a little bit on the nose for some people, but hopefully throughout this talk you, you'll be able to, to see why I think there's actual risk here and how misusing bug bounty or misunderstanding bug bounty can really do you a little bit of harm, can even put your security posture at risk, uh, and how, you know, treating it as the buzzword, as the fix-all thing, uh, is actually the, down, the downfall, potentially, of your application security posture. Um, so, a little bit about the agenda, and uh, by the way, feel free to, to ask questions uh, throughout. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the idea of bug bounty, the philosophy behind it, what it was supposed to be. Uh, when it just came and started, uh, and sort of what it became over the last few years, and how it shifted. And then I'm going to share a real-life story from our experiences at Wix um, of what happened with our bug bounty program and how it sort of uh, shifted our focus. Um, then we're going to just talk about the risk, how bug bounty can actually do you harm, like straight to the face, no sugar coating, what is the risk and what can happen if you misuse it, and most importantly, how not to let it happen. So how to how to avoid this risk as far as best as you can to try and have uh, actually the good results that you expect from bug bounty. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, so again, my name is Zohar. I am leading the application security group at Wix uh, for the last three years or so. Um, I've been in application security a little over a decade now. Um, started... Uh, in consultancy, uh, penetration test, red team, SDLC, research. You can find some uh, blogs I've written online. Some of them got some traction. Um, did a lot of offensive stuff and a lot of bug bounty uh, myself. Um, we'll talk about it in a moment. But a little bit about Wix. Uh, if you've never heard, Wix is a website builder. Um, so it's a SaaS solution. Uh, you get hosting. Um, out of box, you don't need to worry about it. Um, and it's one of the biggest in the world. So we have over 250 million users. And the last time I heard, it's around 7 or 8% of the websites on the internet are actually Wix websites. Um, and on the back end of things, we have around 5,000 microservices, um, which translates to over 20K endpoints, some internal, some external, uh, 2,500 developers, actually a bit more. And 50 member, 15 members of the application security group. Um, so traditionally, as you can see, the relation between the amount of developers and AppSec is, is not the best. Uh, so that means that we actually have a lot of issues, as you can imagine. And our bug bounty program pays roughly 2,050k a year. Uh, that's dollars. And uh, this number is growing. So, so we have a thriving program. Uh, and I myself love bug bounty. Um, Contrary to my, you, what you might think from the title of this talk, I love bug bounty. Uh, I used to do quite a lot of it myself, focusing mainly on Google. Um, I'm not that active anymore, but when I was uh, in my um, peak, uh, I reached the number 24 in their Hall of Fame. I, I was really engaged, spent a lot of time researching Google inside and out. Um, have a blog about some of the more interesting findings. Uh, that I encourage you to check out. And I actually got some recognition from Google. It was all nice, you know, like they invited me on some uh, nice uh, bug bounty event uh, where we had some opportunity to hack new products that were still not available to users. It was great. Uh, they mentioned me as one of their top contributors. It was all nice, all great. And that was all before weeks. <laughs> before I switched sides and became like, person who looks at bug bounty from the uh, uh, person who's running the program and not particip participating in the program. So it used to be great for me. Uh, but let's try to understand 
what bug bounty is actually meant to be, or what was the original idea. And I think it's widely misunderstood, uh, not only within the security community, so not only us, but also people outside in the R&D, in the management, in the marketing department that I talk to often that think that bug bounty is some magical thing. They hear it all the time and they think it can help them to solve all the problems. And you can actually hear people, even from security community, even penetration testers themselves say things like, hmm, perhaps bug bounty can replace penetration tests. Perhaps you don't need an AppSec team because you have bug bounty, so it's sort of compensate. Uh, you might even believe these um, sort of statements, but I don't. Um, coming back, did you know that Bug Bounty, by the way, started as early as 1983? This was the first program. I was shocked to find out uh, by some car company. You can check it out. It's on Wikipedia. Uh, and it was not meant to be security control. It was meant to be a way for researchers to talk to you if they have an issue, which is... You know, like, like the understanding is that, okay, there are vulnerabilities, right? It doesn't matter how much you invest in security. It doesn't matter how many upset people you have. You're going to have vulnerabilities and people are going to find them. So it's better that we have a way for them to let us know instead of posting it on Reddit or something, right? So if I provide an outlet and I tell researchers, okay, I'm here. I want to learn about security vulnerabilities that you find. I want to fix them. Um, th then there's a higher chance they'll reach out to you instead of, you know, um, misusing it. It shows that you're dedicated and you're willing to, to invest the effort to solve security problems. It's still not uncommon to find uh, researchers struggling to, 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 to find who to report to, but let's put this aside. But that was the original philosophy, okay? I have an outlet. You can speak to me if you find something. It's not encouraging you to be my security researchers. It's just that if you find something, please talk to me. And like from a nice story from the good old days of a friend of mine uh, that was before money was a thing in Bug Bounty. It was just, you know, a, a thing for security researchers that, that love, you know, to, to investigate things. And a friend of mine called Rotem Bau, you might have heard of him, he's like a quite famous uh, Bug Bounty researcher today. Um, he found a cross-site scripting uh, vulnerability on Gmail subject line, okay? So you send someone an email, and in the subject line, he put a, a cross-site scripting payload that popped an alert, okay? And that sounds a bit scary, right? Imagine, right? Um, so he reported it to Google. It was before the bug bounty started, and what did he get? An honorable mention. It's nice. Today, probably 15, 20K for this, right? But he got an honorable mention. Um, by the way, it's no longer available even online because <laughs> it was before their current Hall of Fame. It's the old one. Uh, so he managed to find some cached version of it. But, you know, he didn't do it for the money. He did it because he loved technology. He was uh, interested. He, he wanted to, to understand what's happening in the uh, Gmail when he uses it as a user, as a security researcher, and not just poking around to get his name on some list and get some bounties for it. However, now, that's not really how it works anymore. Uh, it became so popular and there's so much money in bug bounty that researchers figured out, wait, why should I go and be a penetration tester? Why should I go and do uh, whatever uh, threat modeling? I can just do bug bounty and it can be maybe even my main income. Um, so people started using bug bounty as a source of revenue. And when it became a source of revenue, it's also shifted the motivation of the researcher. So if Rotem, my friend, was interested in Gmail because he was interested in security, nowadays, at least some security researchers, uh, bug bounty researchers, are interested in money, okay? which is a different motivation. And from motivation comes result. Like Rotem at the time understood what the vulnerability is. He understood the potential impact. Security researchers today, or bug bounty researchers today, don't necessarily understand the impact. They don't necessarily care. They care about the dollars that come at the end of the report. Um, so that means that they, they shift their focus to other directions. And it also means that the companies themselves, like the organization that run the bug bounty, sometimes forget what bug bounty is there for uh, also. So... If before they used to think about it, the company as, as, as an outlet, now it's like, okay, you have a bug, you have a security program, you need to have a bug bounty, right? 
right? It's the first thing on the to-do list, and people will ask you, where is your bug bounty, where is your bug bounty, where is your bug bounty? You need to invest effort in it to have a bug bounty before you do your other security controls. And I'm no uh, saint, it affected me as well. So here you can see one of my first submissions to bug bounty, I think it's like six or seven years ago, um, when it started to become more of a thing. And, you know, I, I spent like, let's be fair, probably an hour poking in some target and I didn't find anything of significance. But, you know, I wanted to get my toe in the water, so I reported um, the most ridiculous thing ever, uh, URL redirect loop, right? So I found an endpoint that you can point a user to and he goes into a redirect loop and the browser says, oh, okay, I can't load the page. And I, I, I can't... Like, like, it's embarrassing for me to show you, but I'm showing you because I reported it and I got paid for it, right? So there was someone on the other side that said, hmm, this bug bounty researcher reported the vulnerability to us. He probably knows what he's speaking about, you know? Uh, so let's pay him for it. And I earned $100 for it. And still to this day, I'm, I'm, I'm like embarrassed that, that this is one of my first submissions. But I think it shows you a little bit of the problem. And let's think about money for a moment. Let's, let's see how it actually translates into numbers. In Google, if you report a very high-risk issue, let's say um, process scripting on Google.com that uh, affects all users in the world, I don't know, a billion users of Google, maybe more, they can pay you well for it. 10K, 20K, maybe even 100K. But how long will it take you to find it? Like, what skills do you need to have to find a cross-site scripting on Google? I don't know for everybody. Um, for me, it can take months. Like, when I was uh, doing a lot of bug bounty uh, with Google, sometimes I would spend weeks and months finding nothing. And maybe weeks and months finding a very low severity issue that is not worth 10K. So, and for all this time, you get nothing, right? If you don't find anything, no one cares. So, okay, doing bug bounty in Google for uh, money's sake, not really the best bet, unless you're very, very, very good. However, how much would you get for a subdomain takeover? I don't know, $100, $500 in some programs. How long will it take you to find it? Five minutes? Six minutes? You can actually write a script that finds subdomain takeover Everywhere, you just give it a domain name and it's fine. It goes to the DNS records, exploits them, it's easy. Actually, that's what bug bounty researchers do today. They have this tool that just look at all the targets on HackerOne, try to enumer enumerate all the domains and do takeovers everywhere. Why? Because it's easy to do from a technical side. So, yes, it's only $100, but you do it once, you get um, a tool that just generates income for you. Maybe a better spend of your time as a researcher. So we get less deep dive researchers and more widespread researchers, less researchers that invest the time in security res research and more researchers that invest the time in actually DevOps and, and, and development of security tools. And what does it mean? That researchers don't, max don't focus on maximizing security, but on maximizing the profit. That actually means low hanging fruit, usually. Okay, like, there are obviously edge cases, but usually it will mean that researchers focus on low-hanging fruits. They can replicate easily, automatically. But should you, from the head of the security um, AppSec engineer, the person from within the organization, should you prioritize your efforts the same way as the bug bounty researcher? Like, are you worried? Am I, am I worried about this subdomain takeover on some random domain or this cross-site scripting on a domain with no cookie? Not that much. I am worried about some RCEs in my CI pipeline or some, I don't know, SSRF to grab, but the researchers don't look there or don't really look there. They look at the low hanging fruits. And if I direct my team to focus on the bug bounty, I actually direct them to focus on subdomain takeovers instead of where I want them to focus. So let me let me go into a story. Okay, so so let's try to connect it to real life. Because 
you might say, well, yeah, Zohar, that's a nice story, but it's not actually true. You just need to have a good variety of researchers and a great pool of researchers. There are many types of researchers. Some are very, you know, dedicated and then they find deep dive, blah, blah, blah. Well, okay. Maybe that's true. So let's do an experiment. We did this experiment at Wix. Okay. Um, so how did we do this experiment? So for years, we didn't have no SQL injection report in our bug bounty program. Like zero, okay? Not one. Not false positives, not true reports, zero. If you are a bug bounty believer, you can assume that means that we just had no SQL injection issues in Wix, right? We have researchers, 250k paid in bounties per year. If there was ejections, they would find them, right? So you'd assume we didn't have any, but actually that wasn't true because we knew internally that we do have some issues here and there. We were able to find them. Uh, we even wrote a tool internally to help us detect uh, SQL injections because we worried about them so much. And check out uh, Moti's talk about it tomorrow if you're interested about how to detect SQL injections at scale. So, so, so we we had issues. Bug bounty couldn't find them, but we had them. So we decided to run an experiment. Like why? Why does it happen? Why don't they find? Maybe, like we even went mentally to this point, maybe SQL injection is so hard to find and so complex and blah, 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 and the um, probability of it being detected is so low that it's not even that risky. And if you're sitting there angry at me right now, you should be, because it's a stupid thing to say. SQL injection is like one of the most critical things you can have, but researchers don't find it. So we run the experiment. We ran a SQL injection challenge. This is something that you can do, uh, let's say, in Hacker One, Backcrowd, whatever. We just decided to notify all our researchers we up the bounty for SQL injection per specific month by 150%. This month we focus on SQL injections. Please find them. We pay you more. Um, this did two things. So, first of all, okay, yes, it gives the researchers more money. So, they might be more motivated to look for SQL injection now because we pay more. But... To be fair, we paid for SQL injection a lot to begin with, right? For a critical SQL injection, you can get it weeks, I don't know, 10K, then now 15K, it's a lot of money. But more than the money, it's actually told our researchers, hey, look, we at Wix know we have SQL injections. We worried about it, so we run a challenge. So if we are worried about it, maybe there is something for you there to find, right? We gave them the, I don't know, cheat sheet, we told them, this is something that happens at weeks. Like, it's impossible that you don't see it. We see it. Look for it. So this tiny change of motivation was highly effective. We just ran this bounty, this uh, challenge, and within, I think it was within the first week, after years of having no SQL injections in the program, we received three valid submissions. Okay, within the first week. So yeah, researchers are able to find SQL injections if properly directed into this direction, right? So, again, if you're a bug bounty believer, this is the point where you say, haha, I knew it. Bug bounty works, you just need to uh, coordinate your researchers better, you need to manage your program better, and it works. But I think it actually highlights why it doesn't work, or doesn't work as we think it works, because the whole idea of bug bounty is not to tell me what I already know, Right? If I know I have SQL injections, I don't really need the researchers to tell it to me back. Right? I, I know it. I'm hoping naively that bug bounty researchers would tell me about the unknown things, the things that I'm unaware of, the issues that I don't know exist, and they do, because there is a wide, wide, wide community of researchers with knowledge that uh, exceeds my own. Our experiment shows that it's not really like this. Bug bounty does not provide you coverage. It doesn't look at any, everything and anything. It looks at specific things where your researchers are looking for reasons that are not security. The reasons is money. Okay? So, how does it actually translate to risk, in my mind? Um, ever heard about survivorship bias? Where of the term? Survivorship bias, again from Wikipedia, or survivor bias, is the logical error of concentrating on entities that passed the selection process while overlooking those that did not. This can lead to incorrect conclusion because of incomplete data. So, there is this famous uh, case from uh, World War II, 
or maybe World War One, <laughs> one of the wars, uh, where um, I okay, I don't remember the exact details, but I think it was the uh, British Army looking at the airplanes returning from the battlefield, and there were some clear um, uh, groupings of where the planes were hit. Right, so all the planes that were coming back from the battlefield were hit in those spaces, you know, like around the wings and, and here and here and here and here. So the British army said, well, so let's defend those areas, you know, clearly this is where the planes are being hit, right? <laughs> and uh, luckily there was some mathematician there, I forgot his name, that said, actually that's not how it works. That's the opposite of what you should do, because these are the planes that survive. You know, you don't see all the planes that crashed. What you should actually do is protect this area that clearly, if you're hit there, you crash. Okay? So this is survivorship bias. Like, it, like you see a part of the uh, picture and you draw the wrong conclusions from it. If we try to think about it in terms of bug bounty, these are subdomain takeovers. Okay? You have a lot of them. A lot of them, right? And these are cross site scriptings. You have a lot of these too. So what should you do? Should you protect these? Or should you care about those, you know, hiding RCEs that you're not reported about, but probably someone is exploiting them right now? Hopefully not. So the risk, as I see it, the, the first and uh, foremost risk is relying on bug bounty to highlight your actual issues. Bug bounty can help you identify some recurring issues. Sure, if you have subdomain takeovers every day, you might need to look into it, but it might just be the focus of your researchers. They have their own motivation and reason to focus on specific vulnerabilities. Maybe that's what they know. Maybe that's what they automate. Maybe that's what's easy for them to produce. It's easy ma For them, it's money. It's not security. So you can't rely on them. Learn from the story that we uh, had at Wix. You can't rely on the bug bounty researchers to do the dirty work for you and find all the areas where you need to focus. You just can't. Bug bounty can help you a little bit in this, but generally you need to figure out where your risks are, where your vulnerabilities are. Um, and I think that the problem even escalated because almost all of us in the AppSec world are actually also bug bounty researchers ourselves, right? Like we, we do security by day, bug bounty by night, which is cool, right? Like we all like it, it's fun, it's nice, but it sometimes means that we also shift our uh, thinking as AppSec engineer, and if at night we wrote a script that, you know, finds subdomain takeover, then maybe we bring it internally and now start doing it as an AppSec engineer and also focus on the same things. And I spoke to many of my colleagues over the last few years that encountered the same. You know, you recruit someone, they're super strong uh, bug bounty researcher, they have deep technical understanding, everything is great, and then they start looking at their own company as external researchers because they replicate the things that work for them elsewhere. So you need to be aware of it, right? You need to make sure your team, like you're the white hats, the, 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 the white box researchers, they're not the black box penetration tester, and you're definitely not the black box uh, bug bounty researcher, and you need to focus on where your organization needs you, and not where it's easy for you to grab those findings, you know, and open those tickets. It's not the same thing. Um, and if you're not worried, and if you let this happen, you might find yourself with an uh, entire security team focusing on the wrong things. Like you're it, 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 it's super easy to get uh, caught up in this mentality, you know, we need to keep our researchers happy, bug bounty is important, we need to pay fast, and fix fast, and um, especially people from outside the security community, you know, marketing uh, and, and R&D managers and people who don't do security every day can tell you, wait, this was from bug bounty report, this is more important than this issue that you found internally. They know about it outside. But it's actually not true, right? It, it, like, it, you can't shift your focus according to bug bounty. You need to understand, look at your uh, organization objectively and understand where you need to focus and make sure your resources are there. Don't prioritize your work according to bug bounty because they're not prioritizing their work according to your needs, but according to where, you, uh, where, where they can get paid. So focusing too much on keeping researchers happy, also a risk. 
sometimes the price of it is actually your security. If I'm trying to summarize it, how not to let bug bounty kill your upset posture, or what you should actually try to, to keep in mind and avoid. And I know it sounds like a, a big word, kill your upset posture, but I think it, it actually can happen if you're not aware of it. Just keep in mind, bug bounty is cool. We all love it. It's an essential tool. We need it. We need to have a way for researchers to talk to us, but it's just a tool. It's not your entire security control. It can't be. It's not everything that uh, you need to do. It's just one part of what you need to do. And you need to use Bug Bounty to support your objectives. Okay? If you have uh, in your strategy, you need to focus on some things. Sure, point your researchers there, do the challenges, but don't let them do it back to you. Don't build your strategy based on what they tell you. Keep testing your program and make sure you have as wide array of talent as you can. And a good way to do it is actually challenge them outside of their comfort zone. So if you see many, I don't know, issues around SSRF, try to challenge them about XXE. If you see many reports about XXE, try to challenge them about, I don't know, uh, cross-site scripting, right? Try to, try to fill them out to see where they focus on and try to shift them to other areas to see if they actually have the, the, the talent, if you have this in your bug bounty pool. Um, don't think that bug bounty will provide you coverage. It will not. Um, if you have an um, application that you're putting out there on the internet and you didn't threat model and you didn't penetration test and you didn't do all those things that you need to do, hoping that the bug bounty researchers will let you know what's wrong with it, that's a bit naive, and I'm afraid it doesn't really work. Uh, I think you need to keep in mind that, that all those security controls are there for a reason, and you need to keep having them even more than before. And bug bounty is maybe the last line of defense, but it's not the entire security perimeter. And most importantly, don't measure yourself according to bug bounty. So the fact that you have or don't have... Um, Issues on a specific area doesn't mean that you're doing a good job or not doing a good job. It just means that this researcher is focusing there. It might be good for you, it might be bad for you, but don't, don't use it as a measurement. And don't let other people in the organization measure you according to your bug mount. And with that, um, hopefully, <laughs> I managed to convey a little bit why I think bug bounty is wonderful, but risky. And hopefully it's a little bit less controversial than it was at the beginning, the first slide. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Yeah. Within weeks? Yeah. So I actually prefer not to answer it. Um, but but it's not as varied as we would like it to be, if all honesty. Like, I think we have a good pool of researchers, and we work hard to, to motivate them in different areas, and we keep inviting and adding more and more researchers. And actually, at Wix, we have quite high bounties, so we enjoy the fact that, you know, researchers are motivated to work with us. But still, I think there are some issues where we don't have particular expertise, and, and we would love to have it. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Like, I, I used to do a lot of penetration testing, and in my experience as a penetration tester, in my company as a consultancy, we would hear it often <laughs> from competitors that, yeah, you can actually, you know, be uh, sort of some sort of a middleman between the company and bug bounty, you know, some, some way like this, and just write a good report. But I think it's embarrassing as a penetration tester, to be honest. I think that they're paying you to do a service that is different than <laughs> bug bounty, 
And yeah, unfortunately, there are some bad vendors there, but, but a good penetration tester should, should look at the entire application, not, not just focus on where he sees issues, you know, focus on everything. Sure. <laughs> So, so first, this is interesting, and yes, generally speaking, you know, there is a correlation between how much we pay for something and how much, we, how much effort we think it's required to find. Um, but it's still a numbers game, so, okay, you pay $10,000 for an RC and $100 for a subdomain takeover. But you're one program out of 1,000 programs. And if you multiply, multiply this $100 with 1,000 programs, you get hundreds of programs. Is way more than the 10k so like it's not that easy you know yeah sure we have you know uh, ridiculously high bounties for specific type of things that we're super worried about and to be honest no one ever really reported anything like this to us it's hard it's hard what uh, like some companies like the biggest in the market like what google are doing for example is they have something called research grants where they would pay the top researchers um, just to do research without, you know, you, you don't have to uh, actually find a bounty. You're just being paid for your time, which is nice. But uh, not everybody can afford that. So, yeah. Thank you, Rafi. I enjoyed it. I obviously come from a fun based provider. So, that's yeah. extra interesting to what you said. But, uh, we, when you first started to talk, you went into the example of the people who. You know, I think in that sense, it was extremely blocky and didn't have to really have to do that work. So, you know, prior to the commercialization of it, you could argue that that was almost charity work that you did, but on behalf of Bob in the long run. So, I would, I would ask you the question do you think, I mean, because you said a lot of comments actually, I mean, I, I believe you do appreciate some parts of it, but is it fair now to have those kind of scriptures actually get paid? Because you sort of started off by saying, you know, you used to be even did it for the sake of it, but you could argue why would anyone do work for the sake of what they I I agree. Uh, of course, you need to, like, it, it's almost unfair not to compensate someone for, for something like this. I agree. But um, there, there is some, you know, if you want to, to hire a security professional, hire a security professional, right? Pay someone for their time and not for their. Uh, necessarily for their findings. It's like you, you, this model is sort of pushing people into findings and not into security, which is not always the same thing. And of course, you know, in the case of hot, I'm sure, like, it's a bit of, a, <laughs> uh, you can call it charity work, but he was super interested in what he was doing, you know, uh, he, he, he loved it. He still does. Now he gets paid a lot for it in the past he didn't. But he, he did it then and he does it now, you know, so. Yeah. Certain not be willing to. Um, so it's interesting. Survivorship bias is probably very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And the only key metric at the time to measure the health of your Linux program. So, for example, your profile is in protection of people who make all the systems that are designed for that stuff. Yeah, tricky. Uh, to be fair, since our challenge, we stopped receiving SQL injections again. Uh, almost entirely. Uh, we do have some metrics internally that we keep track of, especially you know to to validate our other security controls. So let's say we have an issue, a repeating issue with bug bounty, we introduce a security control to prevent it, and we try to look at bug bounty to see if now there are less submissions or no submissions of the same control. Uh, and yeah, we look at how many how many reports we get, how many active researchers, how many types of vulnerabilities over time. Uh, Hacker one are helpful with that, you know, providing some dashboards. But it's always a question mark, you know. Yeah. Do you have a wide enough security researcher pool? I don't know. I don't know. Yes. Yeah. What, what do you think about uh, the 
the one who's interested in the features. Let's say even before they fully released, that's uh, pre production. Um, so you can say, do you ever want you know, as many numbers to find those um, liabilities before you release the. Uh, yeah, the I, I think it's cool. I think it's cool. Uh, we do it. Uh, but it shouldn't be the only security group. Like, you should first bring this product to a maturity level from a security standpoint, standpoint that you're comfortable with, then sure, you can expose it first to the uh, chosen researches that you have. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, So yeah, we, we got more than three. We got three all, all on the same week, and then eventually we got a few more. Uh, we were aware of, um, I think it was, I, most of them we were aware of, and they were on the process of being fixed. Um, but yeah, some were found that we, we didn't know about, of course, and it's good, it's great. Because it was sort of a test, you know, like we had actually was sitting with Moti who sits here and we were discussing, you know, why does it happen? Why do we find the security, the SQL injection that they don't? Maybe it's not like joking, but maybe it's not that critical, you know, because no one can find it. Maybe it's okay. Like it was sort of a joke. We were working, it was, there were not critical issues. There were SQL injections on databases with no important data. And uh, so we were like... Uh, comfortable with, you know, trying it out, but obviously we were monitoring it closely, so, yeah. Uh, so, uh, pointing researchers in the right direction, and offering them more money and more money to do the environment, more tactics to get more money to do the environment, yeah, interesting, I'm sure. Uh, paying a lot, <laughs> you know, is good. Yeah, you know, maybe I can help answering that. I've been trying to find uh, low-level bugs and bug bounty programs for a while, and the risk is very, very high because you're doing, if, for instance, I did the uh, image magic misconfiguration bugs for a while. So every time you upload an image and it's covered to image mm -hmm. magic, there could be a bug if it's misconfigured. It's hard to automate, so there's a certain cost to, you know, getting to the stage where you can run the thing, and the research is quite costly. So I would almost rather if I could get paid for indications, it would be really nice for me as a researcher, so I could get some kind of payoff, even at the stage of being able yeah. to identify the image magic version. Yeah. No, of course, of course. Look, I, uh, yeah, you need to find the balance between how much you pay and what you're willing to pay for. And as I said, some programs do give researchers just money to poke around without the need to find anything, you know, a research grant, something like this. Uh, and we try to uh, track researchers online that we think are doing interesting things and trying to get them to join our program. It's not that easy. Sometimes they are, you know, very well, um, they're popular, let's put it like this, all right? Um, but this is sort of what we're trying to do, and we mainly realize that it's just a tool, you know? Like, we, we get something from Bug Bounty, we get a lot from Bug Bounty, we have a thriving program, but it's not everything that uh, we focus on, and we just keep it as another control amongst many others because of this. Yeah? Yeah, we, we did have a conversation with researchers, and I think it was mostly like what when we said we are focusing on SQL injections, they understood this is something we need to focus on. There's money there, you know? It's like, because otherwise th there is a false sense of, um, as a bug bounty researcher, now with my other head, like when I look at Google, Facebook, Microsoft, whatever, you tend to actually overlook some things because you assume they're already tested, right? You assume, ah, there is no cross-site scripting in Google search bar because it would have been found a billion times. Which means that no one tries it, you know? So, yeah, there, there is some of that also. Cool. Uh, if someone has more questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you, everyone.